Good morning. morning. That was wonderful. They said this is the first time you've ever done that. That was neat. I like it. I like it. Do not pray in vain repetition as the heathens do, because they think they will be heard for their many words. Instead, this is how you ought to pray, not the prayer that you should pray mindlessly over and over and over. Amen to that. That's amazing. Well, if you weren't here last week, and I haven't had a chance to meet you, and you not a chance to meet me, then my name is Zach Langloss. I'm from the Peoria area. Um, I am the father of four beautiful children, all ages six and under. So you could do the math. They're about two years apart. It's a busy house, and and a very patient. I'm a husband to a very patient wife, uh, who who loves me, uh, despite all my shortcomings. And uh, I'm, I'm a pastor, I've been traveling a lot, and I'm an electrician, and I've also been traveling a lot. Um, but I've been asked to come fill the pulpit last week and this week, and so I'm very glad to be here this morning. And uh, my goodness, for all of you in the back, uh, I would encourage you next week to sit right up here in these front seats, because you can hear everything from up here. And there are some beautiful singers here today. I mean, it truly is wonderful to hear the, the wonderful piano and the singing from up here, but all of you sound so wonderful. And I couldn't even sing this morning hardly because I just wanted to listen to it. <laughs> but it is beautiful. It is truly beautiful. Well, today I'm, I've, I've come to talk about Jesus and uh, more specifically uh, names and titles of Jesus. Uh, in the book of John, we're given many. In the very first Verse, we're given, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and what that means is that He's the Creator. In the very beginning, the Word was the Creator, eternal and incarnate, became flesh. And the Gospel extracted from this one statement, from that little bit of Scripture, tells us a whole lot. Revelation 19.3 tells us that Jesus is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The names and titles of Jesus. And then Jesus is also the light, the light of the world. There was once that my wife and I were working on our bathroom, and um, we had to cut a hole out under the sink so I could do some plumbing, and I left a little vacuum, a little shop vac sitting by the sink one night and when I got up to go to the bathroom I I suppose I was half asleep but I thought for the life of me that there was a dog in my bathroom see I was sitting in the dark and I stood still my finger was so close to the light switch but I didn't flip it because I was afraid if I did it would attack me (laughs) like like will I startle this dog or this raccoon in my bathroom oh my goodness That's the darkness. When I flipped the light switch, I realized it was a vacuum. But ten minutes of my life (laughs) to my imaginations in the darkness. But Jesus is the light of the world. And Him within us, His Spirit within us, makes us the light of the world. Within us, the power to cast out darkness, to expose evil deeds and bring them into the truth, the light of the truth. See, we must see through him to see it all. But today I want to ask a question. The same question that Pontius Pilate asked and never got the answer to. What is truth? You see, another title of Jesus, another name of Jesus even, is the truth. One that I hope we'll discover today. And I pray that unlike Pontius Pilate, we stick around to discover the answer to this incredibly important question. What is truth? Who is truth? And my hope is that this morning this will aid us in our own search for truth. But my prayer is also that it will embolden us to speak truth to a world that seems to have forgotten what it means. But before we get started this morning, I would like to open with a word of prayer to the truth. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Spring is certainly right around the corner as we see the sunshine this morning and the cloudless skies. We recognize that your mercies are new today, that your love is right here before us. Father, I pray that you would allow us, arouse us from our slumber even now, to have ears to hear and eyes to see, hearts ready and willing to obey your word. Father, would you reveal to us the truth? Would you help us to come to a greater understanding of who you are and what you have done, the gift that is life and freedom? In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I'd like to read for you from the book of John, chapter 14, just verses 1 through 6. And I really want to emphasize verse 6. So if you would follow along, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus speaking says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go now, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The truth, Jesus says. Eletheia, this title of Jesus, is pivotal to our understanding of eternity. We cannot come to the Father unless we know the truth. Clifford N. Lazarus, Ph.D., wrote in Psychology Today that a fact can be tested or checked. Lincoln was born in 1809. That cereal contains 21 grams of sugar. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second in a vacuum. A belief, an opinion, a taste, or a preference cannot. Corn tastes better than peas. Long hair is more attractive than short hair. Biking is more fun than swimming, etc. What's more, he says, truths and even cherished beliefs change while actual facts tend to remain the same. For example, he says, 1,000 years ago, when people stated the earth was flat, only a few thousand years old in the center of the universe, they were speaking the truth. Now we know our planet is spherical, 4.5 billion years old and orbits a rather typical star, which is but one of many millions, billions even, in a galaxy which is itself but one of many billions in an expanding universe of unimaginable size. He says, this is the truth of the current age. And more importantly, facts that are not likely to change much in the future. Of course, he goes on, there will inevitably be people who, whose truth does not square with objective facts. They will claim the earth is indeed a mere 6,500 years old and the Flintstones was basically an animated documentary. Similarly, an alternate, alternative fact is just a feeble effort to promote what might be one's truth as an actual fact. In actuality, he says, however, a fact is not a matter of opinion. It is an incontrovertible, verifiable reality that is grounded in objective evidence 
it is arrived at precisely because the alternatives have been disproven. He goes on to say about truth. Now, I would remind you that this is in psychology today. This is a very high, highly regarded magazine. PhD. This is a man with a doctorate. This is a very learned man in academia. But he goes on to say about truth that it is what a person has come to believe. If he believes that something is true, then it's true. In terms of permanence, a fact happens to be more permanent. It almost always seems to have no changes. It is more constant than truths. All right. Thank you, Clifford in Lazarus, Ph.D., from Psychology Today. What this man is saying, in broad daylight, in a magazine that affirms what he believes, publishes it, and spreads it to the far corners of the nation, is that your truth is not my truth. He's saying, truth changes like the day. I was here last Sunday. That was a different truth. I'm here this Sunday. New truth. He's saying, or even quicker than the day, a truth can change. It changes like the moment. In the snap of a finger, one truth is gone, and another truth has already replaced it. But facts are more important. Facts are where it's at because facts are objective, right? That's what he claims. But it appears to me that his facts are anything but objective. Now, I'm just Barney Rubble playing in the Flintstones, and I've got my Bam Bams at home, and I've got my dog Dino, <laughs> but it appears to me that Clifford N. Lazarus, Ph.D., is not actually saying anything profound or new, but he, he's exactly just regurgitating what the culture around us has been saying for some time. That your truth is not my truth. There is no absolute truth. But Art Lindsay, Lindsley points out, to make the statement that there is no absolute truth is illogical. Yet today many people are embracing a cultural relativism that denies that any type of absolute truth. I know this is a lot. But a good question to ask people who say there is no absolute truth, is this. If somebody tells you that, you say this. Are you absolutely sure of that? Are you absolutely sure? And if they say yes, then they have made an absolute statement, which itself implies the existence of absolutes. They are saying that the very fact that there is no absolute truth is the one and only absolute truth. In other words, the world around us is willing to believe absolutely anything, but anything absolute. Especially if it contradicts the worldview they're building around themselves. They will believe anything as long as it reinforces what they want to think. Now, if that confuses you, don't worry. It's okay. What you need to know is this. The truth that we subscribe to is absolute. It does not change, and the truth is permanent. In fact, if you were to replace the words with a fact with the truth in Lazarus Ph.D.'s comment, I think it would be accurate. He would say, in actuality, however, the truth is not a matter of opinion. It is an incontrovertible, verifiable reality that is grounded in objective evidence. The truth. It is arrived at precisely because the alternatives have been disproven. I don't know about in your life, but the alternatives for me have been disproven. Jesus is the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. And I would suggest to you, that this, to you this morning that God's alternatives have all been disproven and ultimately will be removed, to put it lightly. 
As an illustration, I think of 1 Kings chapter 18 where Elijah had his burnt offering and the prophets of Baal, whose gods couldn't answer to catch the burnt offering on fire, were eliminated as possibilities. But God, after allowing the prophets of Baal to call on their gods, proved that he was the one true God by sending down flames to devour Elijah's burnt offering before all the people, even by flames licking up all the water that Elijah poured on it. The truth eliminates all other possibilities. The alternatives have been disproven. But we must develop our understanding of truth from Scripture, from God's Word. Remember, that's Jesus, the Word of God. But if we are going to gather our worldview from this world, from the news sources, the news stations, the media, the newspapers, the magazines, psychology today, more than God's word, then we're not understanding the truth properly. Randy Alcorn says about Jesus, He is the truth, truth personified. He is the source of all truth, the embodiment of truth, and therefore the reference point for evaluating all truth claims. Truth is reality. It's the way things really are. What seems to be and what really is are often not the same. To know the truth is to see accurately. To believe what isn't true is to simply be blind. Like myself, thinking my vacuum is a raccoon or a dog in the middle of the night. As we consider this title of Jesus today, the truth, I think we'll gain a better understanding of who he is. And how the truth so impacts us. And what I would pose to you today, the point of this is, and maybe a, perhaps a, a very strong application for this statement that Jesus makes, would be that the truth is our liberation. The truth is a liberation from bondage for us. Therefore, we must, must turn to him. You say, what bondage? A liberation from what bondage? Well, if we turn just a couple pages back in the book of John to chapter 8, verse 31 through 41, we find Jesus talking to some Jews. And he tells us in verse 31 and 32, between the lines, that they are not free. He says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in me, in my, excuse me, in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He's saying that they are not free, that they need to be freed. And they rightly conclude in verse 33 that Jesus must be talking about slavery. If you're not free, then you're a slave. And so they answer him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? But what's interesting is that they have been in bondage. Remember the book of Exodus. They've been slaves. So even they get the historical slavery wrong. But the truth is what Jesus says right here. Most assuredly, I say to you in verse 34, whoever commits sin is a slave of it. And so every human being since Adam and Eve, with the exception of Jesus, has been enslaved by sin. You and me today, brothers and sisters, are enslaved by sin until we are set free, until we are redeemed, purchased from the bondage of slavery, from the yoke of it, and yoked to Jesus. But there is a foremost sin that these Pharisees are committing here. If slavery is a bondage, or sin is a bondage to slavery, then the foremost of that sin is unbelief in him. Unbelief in Jesus is a sin. And the wages of sin, as Romans 6.23 tells us, is death. So there is a sin, 
There is a slavery, a bondage, and then there is death that is the earnings of a lifestyle of unbelief. A lifestyle of lies. Based on unbelief in the truth, a disconnectedness from reality. From God. Now how so? Now sin is a slave labor. Addictions are a prime example of the slave labor of sin. They are work, but they never let you off. People around you with addictions, perhaps even some of yourself, some, some of you in one time or another in your life, and maybe even right now, know that these addictions work you. They work you without pay. They create in you a life of brokenness, turmoil, Tears shackled by the chains of lust, by worldly desires, by greed, by comparison, pride. Where you chase what your eyes see, what your ears hear. You chase money and material possessions. I'd rather have Jesus. But addictions constantly make us chase a new high only to find lows. They're empty promises and pain. I've been there. I've been through addiction. There was a point in my life where I could not stop doing drugs and drinking and saying negative things and having negative thoughts and being all over where I shouldn't be. I couldn't stop. I couldn't do it on my own. And I knew that it had brought me low. But I just kept returning anyway. Thinking this time will be better. This time will be different. Or not thinking at all and just working and being a slave drawn right back into it. There was a radio personality, Paul Harvey, once told the story of an Eskimo. And how an Eskimo kills a wolf. He says, the account is grisly, so I do apologize. But it offers fresh insight into the all-consuming, self-destructive nature of sin. Brace yourself. First, the Eskimo coats a knife blade with animal blood and allows it to freeze. Then he adds another layer of blood, allows it to freeze, and then more and then more, and then more, until the blade is completely concealed by frozen blood. Next, the hunter fixes his knife in the ground with a blade up. When a wolf follows his sensitive nose to the source of the scent, and he discovers the bait, he licks it, tasting the fresh frozen blood. He begins to lick it faster. And faster, more vigorously, lapping the blade until the keen edge is bare. And then not knowing that it's his own, he looks faster and more vigorously, feverishly, harder and harder in the Arctic night. So great becomes his great craving for it. The wolf does not notice the razor sharp sting of the naked blade on his own tongue. Nor does he recognize the instant at which his insatiable thirst is being satisfied by his own warm blood and his carnivorous appetite craves just a little more until the dawn finds him dead in the snow. Now that is how an Eskimo Kills a wolf. That's also how sin destroys us. Chris T. Zwindelberg says in a commentary on Paul Harvey's illustration, it is a fearful thing that people can be consumed by their own lusts. Only God's grace keeps us from the wolf's fate. Jesus says in verse 38 through 41,
not only a slave to sin, we are not only a slave to sin, but a slave to Satan. He says, I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus says to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth from which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. You see, we become slave not only to sin, but to Satan. Very quickly. Child of Satan. The truth is the liberation. The truth is the liberator from that. Go back to Jesus' statement in verse 31 of chapter 8. He says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now that we know what we are free from, we can know how to become free. Randy Alcorn once again says, Truth is far more than facts. It's not just something we act upon. It acts upon us. We can't change the truth, but the truth can change us. It sanctifies us. It sets us apart from the falsehoods woven into our sin nature. How can he set us free? In the same way the Israelites were saved in the wilderness after their exodus from Jesus, or from Egypt, excuse me, exodus from Egypt, when venomous snakes were biting them. Moses had a bronze snake And he held it up, and those who looked at it were healed. And Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. See, Jesus is lifted up on a cross. He uses this similar phrase, I am, ego aimi, I am. It's a not too subtle reference to this Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 where God revealed himself to Moses. I am who I am. I am that I am. And Jesus is saying, I am God. I am the Father. The Father and I are one. God himself will bear your punishment. He will pay the price to set the captive free. He will shake the prison walls. He will release the shackles, break your chains. You just need to turn to the truth and set your gaze upon him. You know, there's an old story about slavery in the U.S. where slaveholders would fill these big iron balls with water and shackle them to the ankles of slaves. But at some point, slavery had become so ingrained that they wouldn't need to fill those iron balls up with water anymore. They were as light as could be. You could run in them, carry them. They were no longer heavy. But many times slaves stayed because it was a habit. Sometimes we, are, we stay slaves, not because we have to, but because we forget that we're not. We forget that there is a truth, that there is freedom. Some of us have been living in bondage for far too long. We run right back into the same old patterns and routines that cause us pain that disallow us to see the reality of God's love in our lives. Jesus says, if you would look to me, there is freedom. The truth is our liberation from bondage, and we must turn to him. Not just to hear from him, not just to hear about him, though that's incredibly important, but to experience him. To experience the truth, Jesus says, I am the door. 
I am the way. Walk in me. Walk through me. Don't just hear the truth. Live in the truth. There is one way to freedom in the truth, and that's Jesus Christ, the one who liberates that we may have life and more abundantly, that we may know him. What of the darkness of man's existence before Jesus? Can you imagine the hopelessness before Christ, without Christ? Someone once said that depression makes perfect sense in a world without hope, without Jesus. If I didn't know Christ, if I didn't know the liberation from bondage, I should be depressed. I should absolutely be depressed. It is amazing to me that people walk through this life and can make it without knowing Jesus. I couldn't. It is far too dark. It is abysmally hopeless. But Jesus offers that every fear can be removed. That you can have purpose and walk in the light and even death cannot separate you from his love. The same love by which we're made whole for the first time and free. Galatians 5.1 tells us it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for your freedom that he has set you free. And then he warns us. He encourages us. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Do not let it. You are no longer a slave, but a son and daughter. And if a son and daughter, an heir through Christ, I would rather know Jesus than be a king. But to know Jesus is to reign with him. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Brothers and sisters, today I encourage you to approach a world that is lost and hopeless with the truth of Jesus Christ, that there is one way, though the world tells you that there are many. You tell them, beloved, that freedom is free and freely available to you today. The world will tell you that he's a lie, that he isn't real, that he isn't coming, that his words are good, but they're not the truth. They're not everlasting. They're not permanent. And God said, let all men be liars and let God be the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Only that we would believe that truth, the truth. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, in a world that is certainly at war, I pray that each and every one of us would consider the statement that Jesus made. The truth sets us free. That he is indeed the way, the truth, and the life. The world would say and suggest that there are many ways. Oprah Winfrey will tell us that all paths lead to heaven. The rest of the world says that all dogs go to heaven. But the truth says... There is one, and his name is Yeshua. Father, would we be encouraged by these words today, and would we think to share them with others outside who perhaps don't know you, who have not come to experience the way and the life. Lord, we love you and we celebrate you today, and as we prepare our hearts to praise you once again with our voices, Would you excite us in your love? In Jesus' name, amen.